as Donny said, I'm working as a researcher at the Optical Networks Lab at the ICT school at KTH, and I will present uh, uh, to you a little bit about the history of optical communications, the advantages and their development, focusing on the bright future ahead. Uh, so optical communications is a very old concept. Uh, people used to uh, uh, communicate uh, visually over long distances because we can uh, see further than we can hear. So already in ancient time, uh, we have evidence of optical communications where soldiers stations al stationed along the Great Wall of China used smoke signals to signal uh, messages from tower to tower. Of course, this was a very, uh, it took a long time to transmit messages in this way. In the 18th century, uh, there was an optical telegraph that was used in France. Uh, there was a line between Paris and Lille uh, that used optical, uh, that used poles, which had mirrors on them. So depending on the tilt of the mirror, they would either reflect the light or they wouldn't. So in that way, they would transmit uh, digital uh, optical symbols. Uh, nowadays, we are using analog uh, optical communications where uh, we are sending optical signals across optical fibers, traveling long distances and supporting really high speeds. Uh, the latest record that was presented just a month ago in the most important European uh, conference on optical communications, which took place in Gothenburg in Sweden, Researchers have reported transmission of 51 terabit per second over 17,107 kilometers. Uh, maybe saying 51 terabit per second doesn't mean a lot to people who are not in computer science. So if we could uh, take the volume of all books published in the modern times, which is uh, estimated to about 130 million, and if each of those books had 100 pages with 500 words per page, then to transfer all this volume using this speed would take only six seconds, which is remarkable. So obviously optical networks today support really high data rates. Uh, they have several advantages, uh, which uh, cannot be met by any other communication technology. Uh, Aside from supporting huge bandwidths, uh, they are also fantastic for long distance transmission because the fib optical fiber as a medium has very lo low attenuation. It is insensitive to electromagnetic interference and so on. Uh, another great advantage is uh, that uh, they support low power consumption, which is extremely important if we consider the fact that the whole information and communication technology sector, ICT sector today, uh, uses up between 8 and 10 percent of the whole uh, global uh, power. So uh, to power uh, the whole ICT sector, uh, it was estimated that we would require uh, annual production of 77 nuclear power plants. Um, Nowadays, optical networks are deployed everywhere on the Earth, in every nook and corner. Uh, and, for example, here we can see how they support communication over shorter distances. This is a picture from inside of a data center. Data centers are essentially huge server farms. Here you can see different servers that are connected with each other using optical fiber. This is the yellow thing. Uh, op, uh, data centers can be really huge. For example, the Facebook data center in Luleå, in the north of Sweden, uh, is as big as three football courts next to each other. Uh, optical networks are also supporting the metro scale communications. Here we can see an example of a fiber map of the city of Amsterdam. Uh, they also support communication between different cities on very high distances. So here, for example, we can see a fiber map of uh, US network. Uh, additionally, they support communication between different continents. Here we can see the uh, uh, submarine cable map. For example, these cables connect Europe to North America and then North America to Asia. And in addition, optical networks are also in the space. 
So here is a, just a schematic view of a recent uh, experiment by Chinese scientists who have demonstrated uh, quantum communication over 1,200 kilometers. While this is really a groundbreaking achievement, we are focusing our research on the terrestrial, so all of these domains here. Um, and to understand uh, the importance of optical networks, uh, we need to know that each and every one of us is using it every single day. But usually people are not aware of that. So here I would just like to explain briefly how is it that light carries information and how is it that we use it every day. So in case you are already an optical networking expert, please look away because I will use a very comic high level uh, 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 illustration. So let's say that you have taken a bunch of cute photos of your pets and you would like to now send them from your computer to your friend in another country. So in the memory of your computer these images are uh, represented as a series of binary uh, digits, zeros and ones. And when this information uh, is fed to a laser transmitter, the laser transmitter encodes this information into the light carrier. The light is then injected into an optical fiber uh, and because of the properties of the fiber medium and because of a specific geometry of inserting the, the signal into it, the light will not leak out of the fiber. Instead, it will propagate down the fiber in a series of total internal reflections. At the receiver end, the optical receiver will convert it back to the digital domain and your friend will receive these images at their computer. Uh, as I said, this is not an actual representation. This is very highly uh, illustrative. I in fact, this is not an optical fiber. This is just a piece of fiberglass showing you what happens uh, uh, with the light, uh, how it propagates. If we would want to take a look at the optical fiber itself, we would probably um, have problems doing it with bare sight because the diameter of an optical fiber is uh, similar to the diameter of one strand of our hair. So here is uh, just uh, uh, one view of uh, optical fiber under a microscope. Uh, there were several key inventions throughout the history that enabled optical communications. Uh, first in 1845, John Tyndall made his famous experiment, which is depicted here. Uh, showing that a uh, ray of light uh, can travel down a bended uh, water uh, 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 thread without being altered. And of course, in today's communications, we do not use water to carry our signals. We use optical fiber. And the first uh, person who, uh, who deployed, who showed that, fiber, that uh, light can travel through bended fiber was a German doctor, Heinrich Lamm, in thir 1930s. But he didn't use it to communi for communication purposes. He used it uh, for uh, medical purposes. Uh, and the, the images that he created were very poor quality. Uh, through history, there were several improvements uh, of this technology. Uh, in 1960s, uh, one of the key inventions was uh, the invention of a first gas laser, which enabled uh, generation of continuous light signal. Until then, it was only discrete. Uh, and in 1966, Kao and Hockham uh, developed the prototype of today's optical fiber. Uh, here is just an image from the original paper. Uh, an interesting thing to note is, so this is showing attenuation for different wavelengths. And in, it's interesting to note that um, the lowest attenuation that they were able to achieve then is 0 0.2 decibels per meter, and nowadays it's 0 0.2 decibels per kilometer. So this is how far we have come since then. Uh, Kao got the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking achievements concerning the transmission of light in fibers for optical communication. And uh, another, uh, another um, uh, groundbreaking uh, achievement uh, that is not shown on the slide was the development of uh, erbium-doped fiber amplifier which enabled communication over long distances. Uh, it was uh, developed in 1987 uh, by David Payne, Sir David Payne. So uh, 
Throughout history, we have had different generations of optical uh, networks. The first systems were only point-to-point -point transmission. Uh, they were uh, using different spans and different transmission speeds, but all of them were point-to-point. -point. Uh, in 2000s, we are uh, entering the era of real optical networking, where in the early systems, we still have only point-to-point -point, uh, optical communication, which means that at different nodes in the network, the signal is in the electronic domain. So only the transmission between two different nodes happens in the optical domain, along with optical amplification. Um, in the, in the now, uh, nowadays, uh, in commercially deployed optical networks, switching also takes place in the optical domain. And this is really important because uh, now signals can tran can travel from the source to the destination through many intermediate nodes without leaving the optical domain. So they can be sent from an input to any output based on their wavelength without being converted to the electrical domain in between. And this makes it very flexible for, uh, this enables very flexible and transparent communication. Nowadays, optical networks are undergoing uh, strong uh, and rapid evolution, which, uh, is, multi which is a multifaceted process. Uh, it, is being, uh, uh, it is developing towards elastic systems where spectrum is not anymore uh, following the fixed grid, where channels have exactly the same width and specific central wavelengths. Nowadays, they can, the, the width of a channel can be uh, arbitrary and the central frequencies can, so, can also be changed. Another aspect of, the, of this uh, evolution is uh, towards virtualization and softwareization, where uh, the different network functionalities are not anymore tied to specialized hardware. Instead of that, they are implemented as software and as such, they can be run at different places, at different devices in the network. The network is also envisioned to provide flexible uh, operation. They should be very agile. They need to be very robust, very resilient, very secure, and so on. Uh, this is just a few uh, records for different types of fibers. Uh, the future vision of the network is uh, driven by the digital transformation towards a network society, which is a process that is uh, encompassing many different, uh, many different trends. Uh, for example, we are witnessing the proliferation of cloud computing. In cloud computing, the users are not anymore interested in physical uh, uh, location of their data or having uh, devices, computers at their physical premises. Rather than that, they are uh, using remote data centers, which host a lot of computational and storage resource. And it is envisioned that by 2020 or 2024, the uh, about 92% of all network workload will be processed by cloud data centers, which will give rise to a massive amount of traffic. Uh, some predictions state that, that, that uh, cloud computing will create about 1.2 zettabytes of data per month, which um, if we would say that one byte is, let's say, one millimeter thick, just for, for illustrative purposes, uh, then 1.2 zettabytes would be equivalent to the distance from the Earth to the Sun and back six million times. So it is a huge amount of data. Another trend that we are witnessing is the growth of uh, autonomous and connected vehicles. Connected vehicles are already uh, on the road and autonomous vehicles are already in a very, very advanced phase. Um, the, um, these vehicles need to be connected to the network uh, to be able to optimize the, the routing decisions. Uh, they, they often have very demanding infotainment systems uh, and uh, it's not, uh, the challenge is not uh, in the amount of traffic that they will create, but in the patterns of the traffic that they will create. So uh, the network will need to be able to handle the peaks of, these, of the traffic uh, at different locations. 
Uh, we are also witnessing trends of growing e-learning, uh, augmented and virtual reality applications uh, that are expected to increase 20 times uh, in the following years. Uh, there is a massive uh, growth of the number of network devices. It's expected that uh, the number of connected devices will exceed the world population and they will need to be ubiquitously connected to the network. So the machine-to-machine -machine connections, it's envisioned that there will be about 2.3 billion of, connect of connections between different machines. Another quite demanding application would be e-health and remote surgery where uh, the, the doctors would be dependent uh, and the patients uh, in the first place would be dependent on very reliable network with a very low delay. So as we can see, communication network is basically the nervous system of the network society. Here is one image of, uh, uh, of the uh, heterogeneity of the network, which is uh, uh, very nicely, it was very nicely depicted by Professor Dimitra Simeonidou from the University of Bristol. And it shows s many, many different devices, for example, massive data centers, uh, home users, mobile networks, connected cars. Uh, that will all be using the optical networking in infrastructure. And here you can see that the wireless and the wired network are actually coexisting. And be it's a traditional way of thinking to consider the these two networks as totally separate. But in fact, this shows that they, are, uh, that they need to be considered jointly and optimized jointly in order to, to get the best out of both worlds. Uh, for example, we can see that the mobile network is essential to provide mobility and connectivity to users and that the wired network is essential to provide flexible and high capacity transport. In, in uh, essence, all of these very heterogeneous devices need to be able to be plugged into the network and function normally uh, uh, with any other device, basically. <clears throat> so the challenges that are posed uh, in front of today's networks can be summarized as the massive data rates that need to be supportive, supported, ubiquitous broadband connectivity and user mobility, uh, ultra-low latency, uh, ultra-reliable and lifeline communications, uh, and if in all of that, we need to uh, be sure that we strike all the standard key performance indicators. So the network needs to be cost efficient, resource efficient, energy efficient, secure, reliable, and so on. So probably this doesn't sound like it's super easy to achieve, but with all the research efforts that are uh, very, very strong, uh, we can be quite confident that we will get there. Uh, in the end, I would uh, like to show how optical networks are literally lighting the way towards the digital transformation of network society. Uh, and it's being done through numerous different avenues of research. I will here just point out a few that we are participating in our lab. Uh, one of the research avenues uh, is focusing on uh, developing new architecture and techniques for ultra-high capacity communications. Uh, these efforts include uh, development of new fiber types, new switching components, new amplification techniques, photonic integration. And when we, when, as new uh, technologies are developed, uh, we need to make sure that we plan and design and optimize the network so that the, these new technologies can be deployed in the most efficient way to increase their chances of being actually deployed by the operators. Another research avenue which is very strongly pursued in our lab is uh, towards the flexibility and programmability of the optical layer. Uh, this marks the transition from a uh, very uh, traditional way of managing optical networks as very static, isolated systems operated as a silos towards very dynamic systems uh, which are essentially uh, forming uh, intention frameworks. Intention framework means that the operator will, not, uh, will only tell the network what they need but not how to do it. 
So the network should be intelligent, programmable, and aut autonomous enough to make the actions, to undertake the actions that are required. Uh, another important aspect here is uh, infrastructure slicing and sharing. So the physical infrastructure is shared by multiple stakeholders and different network users are actually assigned uh, in, in an approach that is called network slicing. Each of them is assigned their own slice, which is logically isolated from uh, the slices used by other users, but they are still sharing the same underlying infrastructure. So the slicing needs to be done very efficiently so that nobody gets any degradation of the service that they are not willing to accept. And finally, um, a lot of effort is put on multi-layer network optimization with various different objectives. Uh, here it's important to coordinate between the packet transport layer and the optical transport layer and to really leverage on the programmable control and virtualization paradigms. So I conclude this talk by uh, stating that while, physical, while optical networks have often been considered as merely physical infrastructure isolated from anything else that happens on top of the, uh, of, on, on in other network layers, it's extremely important that, that the network, that optical networks are considered as jointly as possible with all other services that use the network. So I thank you for your attention.